All right, all right, let's, uh, let's, let's get right into yeah, this. Let's get into this. Welcome to Sports Econ 101, the show where we discuss sports topics from a business perspective. I'm your host, Edward Brown, along with my co-host, Bruce McGowan, longtime sports radio personality. Today's show is going to be really fun because our guest, who's our guest today? Well, we got former San Francisco Giant uh, star J.T. Snow joining us, and J.T. is uh, very popular here in the Bay Area, but is well-known nationally, terrific gold glove performer and a clutch hitter. And he played many years in the major leagues, and so it's a real pleasure to get a chance to talk some baseball with him. All right, so he'll be on in the uh, next segment. I want to also let people know at each commercial break, we're going to ask a sports trivia question. We're giving away uh, vacations to the first three emails with the correct answer. Vacations are not sponsored by the radio station, but by Lighthouse Resort and Marina. Link, the uh, vacations are free. They're only request a $75 cleaning fee to cover the housekeeping expenses. Check them out at lighthouseresortandmarina.com. Today's trivia theme is going to be baseball careers they'd rather forget. Now, obviously, JT's is not one of those, but uh, there's going to be a few questions here. We've got three questions of me. You'll, you'll kind of laugh when you hear them, but then you'll go, oh, yeah, that's right. Those guys, oh, my gosh, yeah, I'd rather forget those, uh, uh, excuse me, those, uh, the, the, those careers and yeah. how they ended there. And uh, when we get JT on in just a minute here, uh, you know, he did play with Daryl Hamilton. Mm -hmm. Kind of find out what's going on with that. Talk a little bit about the World Series 2002. Also, uh, want to ask him about picking up uh, Dusty Baker's son at home plate. Ah, that's that right. Yeah, that's yeah, the World Series against the Angels. Yeah, that'll be kind of fun. Yeah. All right, this segment of Sports Econ 101 is sponsored by Pacific Private Money, providing mortgage investments that are currently yielding over eight percent secured by real estate, Bay Area real estate, by the way. It doesn't get any more conservative than that. You can check them out at PacificPrivateMoney.com. You can listen to Sports Econ 101 on TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, Sports Byline USA, and CRN, <laughs> as well as many other terrestrial stations around the country. Jeez, I didn't know we had so many outlets. That's yeah. amazing. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, we hear from people all around the country. There you go. All right. Stay tuned. You're listening to Sports Econ 101. When we get back, uh, we're going to have J.T. Snow, former Giant and Angel. That's right. You should mention he was starting his career with the Angels. That's right. Or well, actually, with the believe it or not, the Yankee farm system. We'll get it. Okay, we'll get into that. Yeah. All right, stay with us. Yeah. All, All right. right. Thanks for your patience, JT. We are now going to just save the file and we'll cut Got it. right into it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So your your boys uh, must be uh, he must be about a senior in high school or coming yeah, up. Yeah, he's going into his senior year. Wow. Yeah, my daughter's going to be 18 tomorrow. She just graduated. And now she's headed down to Chapman University. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. That's yeah I grew up down there in Orange County. So yeah. I that. Yeah. Yeah, my son, uh, he graduated, uh, and he's, he's now living in Irvine. Where, where do you live down the peninsula, JT? Are you down in the San Mateo area or a little further south? Just further south. Okay. It's a little uh, place called Emerald Hills, which is yeah. right about like Woodside. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a nice area. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Great weather. Great like, weather. Yeah, we're up here in, in Marin and Fairfax, uh, where I live, and it's 85 degrees today, which is uh, right. gorgeous. I was up hiking around the lake with my dog and my buddy, and just beautiful up there today. Nice. Uh, yeah. All right. Here we go. No, no surfing this time of the year. The surf is all blown out and small. I'm, I'm blown. Get away from the winter. Uh, uh, time, right? winter I'm trying time. to get Bruce on the Mavericks, but he won't take me. No. Oh, no. he's <laughs> there to look at that. My son's into my son's into surfing too. They have a little surf club at their high school, so they go to Santa Cruz Resort. Oh yeah. Like a, well, you got looking. Uh, his first choice for school is the uh, <laughs> University of Hawaii. Oh yeah. Well, you know, uh, San Mateo Coast and San, uh, Santa Cruz really have the best. Surfing in Northern California. I mean, there's yeah. so many good places. Oh, yeah. yeah. All Not right, here, here we go, guys. Can't get over the stupid cold thing. Okay, here we go. Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. Again, I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Bruce McGowan. Bruce, why don't we introduce our guest? Yeah, this uh, fella is somebody who's very, very familiar to Major League Baseball fans, a good friend of ours who uh, came to San Francisco in 1997 when Brian Sabian became the general manager. Brian Sabian still working with the Giants, but this was. Brian's first year, and he brought in uh, not only J.T. Snow, but Jeff Kent, who became a terrific player, who was, came in a trade for Matt Williams. And he also brought in Daryl Hamilton, who tragically died uh, earlier in the week in a murder-suicide. And, you know, J.T., not to start things off on a negative note, but I know you and Daryl were friends. You played together a year and a half. He made quite an impression in the Bay Area with his ebullient personality, his uh, terrific glove in the field. He was an outstanding ball player and worked in Major League Baseball uh, uh, television. Uh, tell us a little bit about Daryl Hamilton and, and your friendship and, and the, the time you spent with him. Yeah, well, thanks for having me on, guys. And um, just a sad day yesterday, I found out through a couple of friends and 
Um, you know, we all came to San Francisco that same year, 97, like you said, myself, Jeff Kent, Daryl Hamilton, remember Mark Lewis was at uh, third base, uh, Jose Vizcaino was at shortstop. So we were all just kind of like the new kids on the block. And Daryl was kind of a veteran guy that had played in Milwaukee. And he, uh, man, it was, it was a sad story. And, and he was a, a great teammate, a, um, a great friend, a great player center fielder, leadoff guy, really um, just kind of the, the straw that stirred the drink on our team. You know, the leadoff guy was very vocal and always laughing and having fun. I know Bruce, you were around the clubhouse in those days and was always willing to do an interview, uh, treated the media with respect, and all his teammates, and um, just a great guy. And he was doing great things on the MLB network. He was a great uh, analyst, and I think he was doing some work with the Milwaukee Brewers. Um, radio team or TV team and just um, you know I just I heard about it yesterday and I just I was in I was in a fog like all day and um, one of those probably the first teammate that I've had that tragically passed away the way he did and you just wonder what went wrong and my heart goes out to his family um, had a, a little child I think was 14 months old and he was um, there was he was the life of the party he could go on the road uh, he was quick to organize dinners on the road, um, always hanging out in the clubhouse, and um, just a really a real spark for that 97 team. He won the West that year, beating the Dodgers coming down that last weekend, and just, like I said, he was a great leadoff guy, really good center fielder, tracked the ball down. We always used to kid him because he didn't have the greatest arm, so we always you know, had to remind him to hit the cutoff man, but uh, get on base, steal a base, and I believe I played with him for two or three years, and then he went on to the Mets. And um, just, he's one of those guys that he gave you the shirt off his back. And then I remember seeing him a couple of years ago, and had probably seen him for seven or eight years. And it was like you just saw him yesterday. Mm. Just sit down and uh, have a beer with you, and just talk and love life and baseball. So I, I, I was really in shock, and I, I still am today. I just can't believe he's gone. And it's hard to believe it. Hey, I remember that 97 season so well because the, the key game was late in the year. Brian Johnson, who went to Stanford, a great uh, backup catcher, had the big moment with the home run that uh, tied the Dodgers, and you guys went on to win it you know, about a week and a half later. And that team was really the 97 Giants. You came back from a horrible – well, the, you weren't there in 96, but the Giants were, were really a terrible team in 1996, and nobody expected you to win 90 games that year. Yeah, I mean, we, we, had, a, we had a whole new team in – Brian Sabian's first year, he, he uh, made a blockbuster trade and traded Matt Williams, the fan favorite, and uh, brought in about five new players. I remember, like I said earlier, myself and Vizcaino at short, Mark Lewis at third, Hamilton at center, Jeff Kent at second, a whole new infield. And, um, you know, a lot of credit goes to Dusty Baker. He just he told us to believe in ourselves, and it was nobody thought we could do it. Uh, we had a bunch of guys that were traded from other teams, and I think the teams that came from pretty much, you know, cast pass us off and uh, we just in the season went on we just got confidence we believe we had all the parts everybody uh, there was no egos on that team everybody did their roles played their position uh, showed up every day played hard in a, a really tough ballpark in Candlestick it was all our first year and some time to get used to but um, I, I tell you what I still have a picture in my office at home it's one of my proud pictures of when we clinch and we're all jumping on uh, Rod Beck, oh, yeah. um, Bill Miller, myself, and uh, Brian Johnson, we're all hugging uh, Rod Beck. So it's, uh, it was a great year. It was a really fun year. Um, I think we got kind of the raw end of a deal for the home field advantage in the playoffs. We had to go back then. It was We had to go to Miami or go to Florida to play two and then come home for three. And then we lost the first two and then ended up getting sweet and swept. But, um, change the playoffs now, but that's a great team, a bunch of good guys, and uh, probably one of my funnest years in baseball, other than the 0-2 World Series run, but probably 97 stands out there, right there at the top. Yeah, speaking of the 0-2 World Series, wasn't that the year that you picked up uh, Dusty's son at home plate? Yes, that was, <laughs> and everybody is quick to remind me of that everywhere I go, <laughs> even to this day, aren't you the guy? And, um, I said, yeah, and I said, Nobody remembers that I hit 407 in the World Series. <laughs> I had a hit in all seven games. One of only 25 guys to ever do that. And uh, all they remember is picking up 
of Darren's uh, kid. So no, we remember. We had, you know, some us Bay Area people remember it. Don't worry about that. Well, it was an interesting situation because Darren was, I, I believe, about three years old at the time, and Dusty had him as a sort of a little bat boy. He ran out of the field eagerly to get the bat, uh, retrieve the bat from the hitter, and here comes. I, I think it was either uh, Benito Santiago or Rich Aurelia or somebody comes steaming around third, and he's going to run poor little Darren over, and you had just scored a run, I believe, and so you just you just grabbed him. Yeah, what it was was I was on third, and David Bell was actually on second, and okay. Kenny Lofton was hitting. Kenny Lofton was Darren Baker's favorite player, so he was in the dugout arguing with the other bat boy of who was going to go get the bat, and he was really too young to go out on the field, but Dusty let a bunch of the kids be in the dugout. Kenny Lawson hits a, a deep fly ball to right center. I go back to tag up. See there's one out. David Bell's halfway. The ball falls in, so I just jog home, and David Bell, you know, uh, is 45 feet behind me because he's halfway, and I see Darren run out of the dugout. I know what he's doing. I know he's going to get the bat. And uh, Benji Molina was catching for the uh, Angels. Mike Riley was the home plate umpire. And as I'm coming to the plate, I know – going across the plate to get the bat in the left-handed battery box that Kenny Lofton had just left. And so I had to try and get him out of the way because I knew David Bell was coming in behind me pretty close. And uh, luckily I, I grabbed him by the jacket, stepped on home. I tried to kick the bat out of the way and pick up David Bell sliding in behind me. See, that, that's a, a quick thinking first baseman. Those are the kind of skills they teach you in uh, spring training. Yeah. I was, a, I was a big hit with a lot of the moms around the Bay Area. Sure. Oh, yeah. what, did Darren say anything to you, JT, when you picked him up like no, that? No. He didn't know what had happened. He was yeah. really wide-eyed. And yeah. He didn't say anything. I asked him if he was okay. He said yes. And he said, you know what just happened? He said no. And, uh, I took him back to the dugout and said, Dusty just thank you. So it was a, a moment you'll never see again because they changed yeah. the rule for that boys have to be, I think, 13 or 14 now. And just one of those uh, things. But – uh, anybody in my situation would have probably done the same thing. Uh, it's a great story because Darren's probably about the same age as your son now, about 16 or 17, isn't he? Have you seen him in the area? Yeah, I think Darren is a junior, going into his junior year uh, uh, up in the Sacramento area, Granite Bay, and I, he's already committed to uh, Cal Berkeley on a baseball card. Is that right? That's yeah, wow. So he's a really good shortstop second baseman in high school up there. And, wow. Uh, I've been doing some work for the Pac-12 network the last couple of years, and guys at Cal said that Darren Baker is uh, going to be there in two more years. Wow. Excellent. Okay, we're going to cut to our first commercial break here. And, uh, JT, the way we do this, I'll, I'll ask a question. If you know the answer, don't say anything because when we cut to break, and when we come back, if you want to answer it, go ahead. All right? You got it. Okay, so here uh, the trivia question is, baseball careers they'd rather forget. Who was the pitcher for the Mets in 1992 who went 2-14 and 14 and then went 1-16 and 16 in 1993. The first three emails with the correct answer are going to win a free three-day, two-night stay at the Lighthouse Resort. Email edward at sportsecon101.com the answer to that question. Again, I'm going to read it one more time. Who was the pitcher for the Mets in 1992 who went 2-14 and 14 and then 1-16 and 16 in 1993? And I remember that because it was sad. All of us kept rooting against him just to kind of oh, yeah. see how we So you can set the record. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. All right, stay tuned. You're listening to Sports Econ 101 with our guest, J.T. Snow. We'll be right back. I'm trying to remember, I think, I, I remember it was an African-American, Philip, but I can't remember the name. I know who it is. Oh, all right. So I was traded for when I was Oh, oh really? Well, okay, well, you we'll, answer we'll, it we'll let you yeah. answer it. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, a, back that's a good one. Say he was not. a pretty good pitcher, actually, earlier in his career, I think. Yeah, he was really good. And yeah. Then, uh, they were going to, in 96, uh, the Angels were trying to get some pitching, and uh, they were going to package guys up and trade with Matt for a couple of these guys, so huh. I remember that. I always remember you came up, you guys, a whole bunch of you guys came up at the same time. Tim Salmon, Darren Aristad, um, maybe, I don't I don't think Troy Gloss is up, but uh, oh, Garrett, no, Garrett, no, no, no. Garrett? I came up, it was me and Tim Salmon, uh, okay. Damon Easley. Damon Easley. Uh, Erstad was behind us. Jim Edmonds came up a year later. Garrett Anderson? Uh, Garrett Anderson, yes. Our shortstop was a guy named Gary DeSarcina. Oh, yeah. Coach. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, we had a great a young group of That was a group. So interesting okay. that, that you got to face them and all those buddies of yours in the World Series. We should talk about that, too. Definitely. All right. You guys ready? Yeah. Here we go. Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. Again, I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Bruce McGowan. When we get to the first commercial break, we asked this trivia question about baseball careers they'd rather forget. Who was the pitcher for the Mets in 1992 who went 2-14 and, and then 1-16 in 1993? And I understand our guest, J.T. Snow, knows the answer. Let him answer it. I 
think I do. I believe it was a guy by the name of Anthony Young. It was Anthony Young. Very good. And you have an interesting story to tell about Anthony Young, JT. Tell us that story. I was just saying that uh, I was almost uh, uh, traded for him, not straight up, but in a package deal uh, my rookie year after my second year with the Angels. The Angels, they were looking for some pitching, and uh, the Mets were looking for some position players. So it almost went down, and uh, it didn't happen, and I ended up with the Giants. So, uh World. Interesting, <laughs> interesting story though. You came up at a time in the early '90s with Garrett Anderson and Jim Edmonds and Tim Salmon, and uh, you know there were a whole bunch of guys in that group. Uh, Darren Erstad, and that was it. Was, seems like that the Angels were just really uh, coming alive at that time and, and really making a move. Yeah, we had a lot of good, a lot of good talent. There was a turnover. Um, if you remember, Gene Autry had just sold the team. Disney took it over. Uh, we had a really good year in 95, which was kind of our second and third year for most guys. And uh, we, we lost a one-game playoff to the Mariners up in the Kingdom. Randy Johnson beat Mark Langston, and then the Mariners went on and beat the Yankees. And, uh, but we, uh, that year, 95 with the Angels, we had an 11-game lead going into August, mm. two months ago, and we let it get away. But then we ended up coming back to tie the Mariners. Uh, they were, you know, they were loaded with Scripty and Edgar Martinez and Tina Martinez, and it was, uh, it was a pretty good time in baseball. But we lost that one game playoff, and, uh, and then '96 we had a down year, and then I was traded. Ryan Sabian was the director of the minor leagues for the Yankees, who I was drafted by out of, out of college, and played at the Yankees minor league system for three and a half years. So Ryan traded for me from the Angels when he got the job here in San Francisco, and uh, I was there for nine years. You know, it's interesting, uh, JT, you probably won't remember this, but uh, back in spring training back in 2000, I think it was, um, I brought my son, and we happened to see JT in a restaurant, and we were trying to think, okay, well, you know, we don't want to bother him, he's eating, right? Uh, but then when someone had the idea, I said, you know what, let's go up to his wife and ask for an autograph for on a baseball. That's the best thing to do, <laughs> approach the wife, right? Because, you know, otherwise he gets approached all the time. So your wife was very, very sweet. And allowed us to get, and, and it turns out you, you there was a big, you, have, you were with a big group, and we recognized your dad. So we ended up actually going to you and saying, hey, you think you could get your dad's autograph? And you said, yeah, you know, nobody ever thinks about him anymore because now you're the star. You know, he didn't say it that way, but basically right. that's what it was. So right. we went up to Jack afterward, got his autograph, and he was all, like, smiles, like, finally, people remember who I am. <laughs> yeah, he was, a, now he was a great wide receiver with the L.A. Rams, and you grew up uh, as a kid, I guess, J.T., even though your dad was probably out of football by the time you were uh, recognizing and, and following the NFL, that your dad was a legend down in Los Angeles. Yeah, he retired in 76, and I was eight years old. And I remember, you know, a good two or three years going to the Coliseum, watching Roman Gabriel and oh, yeah. my dad. And they just had great teams. And uh, I remember one of my dad's biggest, um, you know, his of his athletic career was uh, not, not a – let down or anything, but he played in four NFC championship games and lost them all and never made it to the Super Bowl. So it was either they either lost to the uh, Dallas Cowboys with Roger Staubach or they lost to the Vikings with Fran Tarkenton. Mm -hmm. I remember as a kid watching those games and uh, on the, you know, a lot of times they were on the road and just, I remember the kid just crying after the game because they came up short again and then I'd have to go to school the next day and I knew the kids were going to hard time about, you know, oh, your dad didn't make it to the Super Bowl, and this kid's at that age when you're six, seven, eight years old can be pretty uh, ruthless, so it, it was a great a great childhood, it was a lot of fun, I met uh, great players, my dad would always take me on Sundays in the Coliseum after the game, he'd always take me to the visitor's locker room, because I knew, I knew all the Ram players, and yeah. that's when they had the fearsome foursome, oh, Erwin yeah. Olsen, Deacon Jones, Rosie Greer, Lamar Lundy. Um, like I said, all oh, Roman Gabriel, and then my dad would always take me to the visitors' locker room after the team that just got done beating heads with. And I got to meet like Terry Bradshaw, and uh, at the time O.J. Simpson, he was a great running back, and uh, Roger Staubach, and all those guys. So wow, it was, it was a really good childhood. Wow, what a what a great experience! And then of course, you know, moving much further ahead, you mentioned after you got traded to the Giants. You got to play against your old team, the uh, the Angels, in the in the 2002 World Series, which was a, a heartbreaking series, but it was a terrifically exciting series. Yeah, it was. It was. It was I, I still think it's one of the best World Series 
you know, today going game seven, and we had a couple close games, a couple blowouts, um, just back and forth, and, uh, you know, we lost game six. We were up by four runs and seven out. We needed seven outs, and uh, a home run by Darren Erstad, and Troy Gloss got a big hit. I think Stanley got a big hit, and uh, game six was the way uh, Scott Spezio hit a three-run homer over Reggie Sanders in right field. And, um, but, you know, after the game, we, we shook it off, and we said we're going to come back and get him tomorrow. And game seven, and then the Angels had a rookie going by the name of John Lackey who's still pitching. And uh, he, he shut us down. They won, and we didn't. And I, I, I think about it all the time because we, we could have been the first team in San Francisco history to, to, to win a world championship since they came to San Francisco. And um, they run into a lot of people nowadays, and now that the Giants have won three, and it's been great. Uh, it's funny because a lot of people still come up and say, I think that 0-2 team offensively was better than any of the, the Giants championship teams now, but we just didn't have the arm that, that they have now. We, we had a, a good rotation with Kurt Reeder and Russ Ortiz and LeBron Hernandez and Rob Ben came out of the bullpen, but Rob Ben was, his shoulder and elbow were blown out. He was trying to, that probably ruined his career, that 0-2 World Series. Mm. Um, so it was fun. It's, there's the highlight to play in the World Series. I wish we would have won it, but life goes on. I tell you, I'm still upset about that. <laughs> I, you know, you know so big giant. So yeah, yeah. I, I am too. I was sitting next to Mike Kruko and the, the Dwayne Kuyper, the Giants broadcasters, because there was a it was a big booth up there, and Kruko was looking over at me and saying, "Hey, we're only you know off mic." He was saying, "Hey, we're only eight outs away." And then after Spezio hits the home run and make it five to three, he looks over at me and says, don't say another <laughs> yeah. word. Don't say another word. I said, I didn't say anything, Mike. You were the one who was saying it eight out of, eight out of the way. Yeah, um, you, you, sometimes you kind of wonder if yeah. it's harder on the fans than it is the oh, players, you know, just God. because you're sitting there. You, you can't do anything about it except just watch. Well, I felt you know? so badly for, for the players. I know Sean Dunstan, who's a, a good friend of ours, uh, said he was up in the clubhouse and he was walking downstairs. That was his last game in the major leagues. And he was saying to himself, God, we're finally going to be world champions. And as he's walking down that long tunnel to go back to the dugout, JT, he said he heard the roar of the crowd, and he thought, this is not good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was hard. I mean, that was, a, that was a hard one to swallow. I mean, that was tough. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, i got to ask you about two guys in particular that you played. One you played with and one you played for. You mentioned Dusty Baker. i got to ask you about Dusty, because he's pretty much out of the game now as a manager. But what a great run. Almost 20 years as a skipper, almost 15 or 20 years as a player, and may have been one of the best managers in terms of his relationship with the, with the guys. Tell us a little bit about Dusty and what made him so special. Well, he just, he was, he managed like he was still a player. And he was always pulling for his players. And he wasn't far removed from the game. So he knew how hard the game was, especially hitting. And uh, he tried to stick with guys when you were struggling and try to pump you up. And uh, his communication skills, I think, were really good. You know, he'd like, no, you're going to have a day off tomorrow or, struggle a little bit. We're going to sit you down for a couple days. Or, uh, so, and, and he was, you know, I give Dusty a lot of credit because in a, in a, in a the game today, the way it is, it's, I don't think it's that hard, uh, not taking anything away from any manager, but the man, you just play the percentages nowadays. You bring the righty in against the righty and the lefty against the lefty and look at the lineup and, oh, this guy's hitting 400, so he's going to start today. This guy's going to sit, but he didn't do that. He believed in his players. He gave you a chance. He went against the grain sometimes and left the righty end to face, you know, the lefty or let a lefty uh, hit against a left-handed pitcher, things like that. So yeah, sometimes uh, you just have to get a feel with everybody. Like, that's not the case nowadays. Yeah. He he didn't care what the media said or he didn't care what other people said. He was he was going to back his players up. And the clubhouse was always loose. We always had music, win or lose, and uh, he made us believe in ourselves. So a lot of the credit. I know towards the end of his career, he got you know, some criticism for the way he ran a bullpen or this he made, but that's just the way he was. And, you know, it, it's, it's baseball. If it comes out the other way, then he's, you know, he looks like a, a, a mastermind. You know, he looks like the smartest guy in the world. But it didn't happen that way, and especially when the Giants beat the Reds, you know, when they swept them that couple two years ago in, in 2012. But he's got nothing to hang his head about. He was, he was fun to play for. Yeah, I remember um... – that uh, you know, Dusty being a uh, Dodger, you know, he was just hated by us giant uh, you know fans. And I remember some idiot in the in the right field pour some beer on him. You know, that's just 
It upset me because it's just it's just so stupid. And then suddenly he's now the, the manager of, of uh, the Giants, and now now everybody loves him. You know, it's a very fickle. Well, that's fan, fans fans are supposed to be fanatic, and fanatics are rarely sane. What about Barry? What about Barry? Oh yeah, let's get to Barry because we do yeah. have to get to a quick okay. commercial break. When we come back. We do want to ask you a little bit sure. about Barry. Sure. Yep. Okay. Okay. So here's our uh, second commercial break trivia question: Baseball careers they'd rather forget. All right. Let's see if uh, JT knows this one. Robin Young was a Hall of Fame shortstop and center fielder. His brother Larry probably doesn't want to talk about his career. He made it into the major league pitching mound one time. What happened? Mm. Okay, so we want to know what happened to Robin Young's brother Larry. Mm. Okay, why did he only pitch one time? All right, so uh, that's the question. Uh, and the first three emails with the correct answer are going to win a free three days and two nights stay at the Lighthouse Resort. Email edward at sportsecon101.com the answer to that question. Robin Yon was a Hall of Fame shortstop and center fielder. His brother Larry probably doesn't want to talk about his career. He made it to the Major League Pitching Mound one time. What happened? Stay with us. You're listening to Sports Econ 101. When we come back, we're going to see if JT knows the answer to that question. And I'm going to guess, I'm going to guess he blew out his arm. His elbow or his shoulder or something. I don't even remember that guy. Do you, JT? I do not. Yeah. And there's a lot of there's a lot of obscure players. Do you, were you friends or did you know Paul Molitor very well? No, just playing against them. Yeah. Really. I know he's he's managing now, isn't he? Up in uh, Milwaukee, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. I always remember he was one of those guys that was just very steady and very calm and you know not real excitable, but uh, he played a long time. Oh yeah. Too. Yeah. Played a long time. It's neat to see some of these guys though that we that you played with, uh, you know, managing now in the major leagues. Yeah, and, and, yeah it's just crazy. Yeah, it, 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 it's hard to believe some of these guys. You know, I just look, think of them still as players, and here they are. Sure. You know, Matt Williams, of course, and, and more, most recently Bud Black, who was a great guy. Yeah, I think out of left field down in San Diego. All right, let's get this thing working. Yeah. All right. Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. Again, I'm Edward Brown, your host, but along with Bruce McGowan. When we get to the second commercial break, we ask this trivia question about baseball careers they'd rather forget. Robin Young was a Hall of Fame shortstop and center fielder. His brother, Larry, probably doesn't want to talk about his career. He made it to Major League Pitching Mound one time. What happened? JT, you got an answer for that, just a, or a guess? He made it one time, so I'm probably going to guess. I don't know. I just thought the time I have to keep. I'm thinking maybe he was warming up or something, and... That, that's it. He injured himself warming up. Oh my god! He didn't even he didn't even get out of the field. Oh my gosh! You ever, ever hear a story like that, JT? That's really sad. I mean, I mean if he made his debut, he had to right. He had to go out and out because he heard it. Kirk had heard it warming up, you know, for the next inning, and then they had to take him out. So yeah, yeah well, just one time. I knew a guy. Actually, there's a guy in the Bay Area named Stephen Weaver who had a similar experience with the Milwaukee Brewers through. Two innings against the Yankees, and I think he struck out three guys, and then he blew his arm out and never pitched again. Well, what about those players who have been up there, and they do one pitch, and they get hit in the head? Uh, you know, that's how it's happened. happened. Um, I, I know that Bruce wanted to ask you about uh, playing with Barry. Yeah, and Barry Bonds, of course. You know, we see him from time to time. He's up here in Marin County, actually, this summer conducting a camp. He looks great. I know he's really into bike racing now, so he's taking a lot of weight off. And I know he's a controversial figure and wasn't the most popular guy with some of the folks in the media. I always got along with him, but... What was it like watching him doing his thing, uh, JT, back in the early aughts when he was going for the records? And it seemed like every other pitch he was, if he was getting on it, it was out of the yard. Yeah, well, you had to realize that Barry was probably getting two or three pitches hit every game. And when he got him, he, uh, he hit him hard or hit him out of the ballpark. So he was, uh, he was fun to watch, you know, and he just you never knew what, what he was going to do. Um, I think it was the bat speed. He seemed to have very fast bat. Yeah, he's, he's the smartest hitter. Uh, and, and I tell people, you know, uh, PEDs or no PEDs, yeah. you can still, like, uh, you can still understand and be a smart, and say smart things about hitting and understand it. And he was by far the smartest hitter uh, when he would talk. You know, he wouldn't offer it up all the time. You kind of had to... Uh, dig on him a little bit or ask him, he wouldn't offer it. But the things that he said and, and came out of his mouth were just were like nobody else about understanding pitchers and pitchers' tendencies and, and swing and, and balance and bat speed and using your hand, all that stuff, keeping your head still. 
Well, you know, I, I always enjoyed watching his dad play, so it's up to yeah, his great, dad, really. Smart guy. Yeah. What was it like? What was it like uh, hanging out with him? He wasn't the most uh, congenial guy. I know he kind of kept to himself, and yet I think he got along fairly well with his teammates. But kind of a prickly personality, and I always thought Barry might be a little bipolar because sometimes he was in a great mood, and other times he just didn't want to be around him because he had this dark cloud hanging over his head. Well, he did, yeah, he didn't hang out with many guys on the road. He kept himself, and you know, but when you get to that level, I. I I tell people I don't I don't care what a guy does off the field I don't care but when you come to the ballpark every day and, and it gets to be seven o'clock and you get between the white lines all all we ask and all you want is a, as a teammate is someone to, to play hard and give you everything you have and he did that for the most part he came out of a lot of games late in his career because he was older and tired and hurt but you know he'd, he'd show up and answer the bell and you know he'd drive and run hit home runs and, and away from the ballpark you know guys. Guys have families. Guys have other interests. Guys do things, and um, you know you don't hang out together. Maybe you go on the road. You might go to dinner once or twice on a road trip, but you kind of just hang to yourself and get yourself ready to play that night. And and that's what, that's all you have for. I don't you don't have to be best friends with a guy, or you don't worry about his personality. But when the game starts, you owe it to your teammates, the fans, the organization to give a hundred percent every time you step on the field. And, um, you know, we just wanted to hit home runs and drive in runs and help us win games. You know, I still don't know how you guys uh, did all that traveling, you know, especially in baseball. It's one thing to do in, in football. You know? That's a long season. It's, uh, you know, basically you're on the road for seven, eight months, and, and most players may keep a home in the, in the uh, you know, for the, with the team that they're playing with, uh, you know, in San Francisco, wherever they are. But you guys, most of you guys don't live in the, in the home city where your team is located, so it really is an itinerant lifestyle, isn't it, JT? It is, and guys... Guys go back to where they're from, or I, I, I grew up in California, and uh, I love the Bay Area. I grew up in Southern California, and it was, it was not a big deal for me to stay up here. And you know, once, once you have kids and they get into a school system, and the, the, the education and the school system is so so good up here in the Bay Area, so we just decided to stay. And, um, you know, that's just the way it goes. But I'm, you know, a lot of guys, you know, a bunch of posies from you know Georgia, and guys are from. Uh, Arizona or Texas, whatever. So after the season, they they go back. Bob Gardner lives in you know North Carolina, so you can't blame them for going back. But I, I was a California kid, and um, you know it was not that hard for just just to stay up here and, and have some stability and get your kids into school and let them have their friends. Because that's what my dad did with us when he was with the Rams, and he had a chance in his career to uh, to go to some other teams, but he said no, so he could you know he could keep our house and keep our friends and stay in our school. That's, that's really important for kids growing up is to have some stability. What are you doing now, uh, Dave, JT? I've been working with the Pac-12 Network the last three years doing some college baseball broadcasting, which I really enjoy. I'm trying to get into the more of the broadcasting uh, arena. I really like broadcasting games, not so much pre-game, post-game, in a studio and critiquing. Uh, I, I like calling a game. I think every game has a different story and every game unfolds in a different way. And so I'm getting a, a, a really good uh, basis and a really good base for me under my feet doing some work with the Pac-12 Network. We did, I did 30, 31 games last year. The network did over 100 games. They're based here in San Francisco. I did a lot of Stanford and Cal, traveled a little bit. I played in the conference because I went to the University of Arizona. And um, I'm trying to uh, just figure it out. You know, my, my son will be off in college in another year and it'll be a little bit of an opening to maybe try some different things. I was, I've been trying to get in with, with the Giants for the last couple of years and get on some radio games and stuff, but uh, they're pretty set in their ways. And uh, so and that's it. Still doing some work with the Giants, not so much on the field, but more PR stuff and appearances. And you get a lot of opportunities to come your way, appearances at games, uh, some promotional stuff things like that. So I'm staying really busy. I love to golf. I play a few times a week and um, that keeps you busy and uh, just enjoy life. You know, I grinded for 30 years playing baseball from high school all the way uh, until the end of my career. So um, just you miss out on a lot of things. Enjoying some summer vacations up in Tahoe. I love to ski in the winter and uh, love warm weather destinations. So just, just enjoy life. And when you show up, uh, you know, if you go to uh, AT&T Park, I'm sure that you just kind of get to go up and talk to Cruz and Kite and 
you know, uh, or, John, or Robinson and just, you know, be on TV and. You mean, you mean, you mean uh, John Miller? John Miller. Yeah, yeah. Why do I say that? Well, Ted Robinson was there a long time. Yeah, I have to say that. But yeah, I, you, what you said about the play by play, though, I couldn't agree with you more because I worked in broadcasting for 40 years, and the most fun I've ever had was when I did play by play because you're at the game, you're talking about the game, you're not having to sit there and, and critique it. And you're right, JT, that is so much more fun. Yeah. It really so is. I'm doing, the, I'm, I'm doing the, the color commentary, and I've gotten to, I got to work with great guys at Pac 12 now. I've got to work with Ted Robinson. Uh, Roxy Bernstein, I've done a lot of games with a guy named J.B. Long, uh, some really good, some really good guys, and uh, just, it's a lot of fun. I do the color commentary, and uh, it's, you know, we, we know the game a little more in and out than the average fan, so that when you bring up a situation or, or you know, where the, where the outfielder should have thrown the ball, where the, the guy running it, where he should have bunted it to, where, you know, watch this pitch, the pitcher missed it. And that's why the guy hit it out of the ballpark. You're supposed to go down and away, but it ran back over the plate. Things like that. And that's really fun to, and to hear people's feedback about. That was a great point you made about, you know, the, the pitch count or the, the guy's breaking ball, not breaking a sharp late in the game. Stuff like that that's, that's really fun that we can see as ex-players that maybe the normal fan can't pick up. But if we can just – my goal when I do a game is if I can – somebody out there one thing that they didn't know before the game started about baseball that you've done a good job and to make them keep coming back and watching the, the great game well that's one of the things you know you gotta you, you gotta know your pitchers you know you're facing them right yeah yeah what they throw and what their movement does what their fastball does and what's their out pitch and what's their velocity difference between their fastball and change up and the release point and you know you just you, you watch guys you can see it in their eyes and you can watch their body language and watch guys that are struggling guys that, that are on, on fire and it's, it's a great it, it, it's a great game and I really appreciate it now that I'm out of the game I can sit back and watch and you know to watch a Giants game or watch the way guys are playing or even the college game these college kids because we were all there once and you're young and uh, it's really fun hey before we let you go we've, it's been a pleasure having JT Snow former major league player on I got to ask you about not only the Giants winning three World Series in the last five years, but how about the Warriors winning the NBA crown and Steve Kerr from the University of Arizona? So you've got to you've got to be in seventh heaven watching the Warriors win, and then of course the Giants with three World Series. Yeah, it's been a great run for the Bay Area, and I'm a huge. Uh, I'm not a huge NBA fan. I don't watch it a lot, but I, I this year with the Warriors, I got I got really into it. Steve Kerr was was down in Tucson when I was there. He was on the 1988 Final Four team at Arizona. I was a freshman. He was a senior. And uh, Andre Iguodala went to U of A, so following him and just the just the way they play the game. Steph Steph Curry the just just joined the, the golf club that I'm a member at. He's a huge golfer, so he comes out and he plays golf and, and just blends right in and no one really bugs him and uh, he loves the golf. He was out there with his dad Dell the other day uh, on Father's Day. I was out there with my son. We were playing around the golf and uh, saw Steph and Dell Curry and. Uh, so yeah, I love following the Warriors. I, I, I played basketball in high school, and that was probably my favorite sport uh, growing up as a kid. But uh, I knew I had no shot at even the NBA. So, um, but yeah, it's been a great run for the Bay Area. Uh, the people, the fans here have, have, have been a little spoiled. I, I think mm -hmm. they deserve it, and uh, they expect great things. And uh, happy, I'm happy that the Giants and now the Warriors have given them. Lot of joy. Did you play much football in high school? I mean, I did. Yeah, I played football, basketball, baseball, and um, I was uh, I, not to brag on myself, but I was old, I was one of two guys in the history of uh, Lawrence County to be, to be all CIF and three sports. Wow, and, uh, that's quite uh, something. All, all county, all CIF and three sports, and uh, played, played quarterback and safety in football as a point guard in basketball. And, Wow. And, and did your dad uh, try to push you into football or out of football? No, not at all. He, he just wanted me to play, have fun, give 100%. And he was actually happy when I chose baseball because he knew the dangers of football and you know, the injury factor. So my dad was a really good baseball player in high school and had a chance to sign out of high school uh, with a couple teams. He was a center fielder. And uh, so he loved, he loved that I chose baseball and really liked following my career. And, uh, so yeah, never never pressured me or and I think I tell people that's one of the reasons you see so many sons of former athletes make it because they don't push their kids. They've been to the top, they know what it takes. They don't have to live through their kids. And I see the youth sports today and so many parents are pushing their kids because they've never been there. 
and I'm the same way with my son. He's a high school golfer. And he's a really good player, but I don't I don't push him. Let him figure it out on their own. And if they have the desire and they have the will, they'll figure it out. Not that my son's going to be a, a PGA professional, but you want them to have fun yeah. and give everything they have when they play and have no regret. So uh, that's the way my dad was with me. And uh, you see a lot of former uh, athletes, their kids end up climbing the ladder because there's not that pressure on them. Dads don't put it on there. Yeah. JT Snow, thank you so much for joining yeah, us here on Sports Econ 101. And it's right. great, okay. great catching up with you, JT. We'll see you out in the ballpark, I'm, I'm sure, very soon. Okay, yeah, okay. no problem. Good luck. Have fun on your show. Thanks. All right. What a great guy. You know, and I have to say, it was always a pleasure dealing with him after games because he never was in a bad mood. No, he's always a good guy. Yeah. Okay, uh, last trivia question. What major league star pitcher broke a 110-year-old record for the worst ERA in a 10 plus start season going four and seven with a 10.64 ERA wow. in the year 2000. Ooh. Stay with us, Sports Econ 101 will come right back. And I have no clue. <laughs> I have no clue on that one. I'm sure it'll be a familiar name though. Yeah, oh yeah, you'll know. Yeah. Well, I've always got JT and, and uh, yeah. Burnham, of course, was typically uh, you know nice about it. He said, oh man, don't worry about it. You get me next week. Yeah. Vernon is such a great guy. He, he really I is. don't know what it is about I think he just I told him once, I said, Vernon, I think you got the happy what is it, the happy gene. Yeah. He just he, he just says a good guy. He's a happy guy. Life. He's yeah. always positive. And you know, if you if you keep that attitude like that, it, you just create more of that around you. Yeah. And you exactly. and you, it's not only just self perpetuating, but you, you create a, a, a world around you that's that's happier. So I'm learning that from my wife because I, I have my little I you know, I'm learning to be less moody. <laughs> well, I don't know much about Vern's upbringing, but it sounds like it was pretty solid. Yeah, yeah, so no, it's real close. I, well, it makes all the difference in the world. If you show me a person who's happy, and I'll show you a happy home life. If you show me an unhappy person, chances are exactly. broken home, unhappy yeah. childhood. Pro chances That's are. Right. Yeah. All right, ready? Here we yeah. go. Last time. Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. Last time for today, I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Bruce McGowan. And we stumped Bruce on this one. Here was a question. Have a clue on this one. What major league star pitcher broke a 110-year-old record for the worst ERA in a 10-plus start inning? Uh, excuse me, season, going four and seven with a 10.64 ERA in the year 2000. And it wasn't a reliever. Do I have a hand? Uh, on this? No, he's a, a starter. He's a starter, okay, and I, he's still pitching today. I still believe. pitching today, and he's now a very good pitcher. Don't tell me, Roy Halladay. Roy Halladay. Roy Halladay. Yeah. I thought Roy Halladay retired recently. Did he retire? No, I think he's still pitching. Is he pitching? Okay, I thought he retired. By that just blows me away. Yeah. Roy Halladay had an ERA over ten in two thousand. In two thousand, yeah. Wow. With over ten starts. Wow. Yeah, we're going four. Funny how he went four and seven. He must have had uh, some good hitting. That guy had I, well, that guy had ice water in his veins. He was one of the toughest guys on the mound. You never want to face him. Yeah. Did uh, he you know. did he pitch uh, either perfect game or no hit or? Like in the last, yeah, years. no, no question. I mean, he was he was the top of the line. He was the uh, you know the gold standard there for a couple of years. All right, so here's our thoughts for the day. Dale Earnhardt said, "You win some, you lose some, you wreck some." <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true in auto racing, huh? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And Pete Rose, which we uh, didn't get a chance to talk about him, we'll maybe get into him next week. Said, "It's a round ball and a round bat, and you got to hit it square." Mm. Not easy to do, but Pete could do it pretty well. Oh, yeah. yeah. In fact, uh, again, when we uh, catch up next week uh, on Sports Econ 101, we'll talk about Pete, how he's been accused of actually betting on baseball as a player, boy. which I, doesn't surprise me. Doesn't, well, it's an addiction. It's an addiction. an addiction. He's never admitted that really he had it, although he said he did bet when he was a manager, but he always denied betting as a player. I mean, I, that, that, and I have a hard time believing that. I just know that, you know, I've known some people who have this addiction. It's too bad. We'll get into it next week. And by the way, our good friend, Vernon Glenn, who used to be a uh, co-host on this show, is going to join us, I believe, next week. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, and we're recording two shows next week. So yeah. He'll be on one. He'll be on the other. Yeah. There you go. All right. Tune in next week to Sports Econ 101. We're going to be discussing sports topics from a business perspective, giving away more free vacations for answering trivia, sports trivia questions. Thanks for listening. On behalf of our team, I'm your host, Edward Brown. We'll see you next week. Good night, America. So long.